Hello everyone, today we talk about early Imperial Roman military standards, um, a topic we already addressed uh, in two videos, actually. Uh, one was actually the late Roman uh, Imperial standards, uh, the other one is the one I inserted in the, in the home of the channel, I may update at some point because it was all about the, the Roman Aquila, the Roman Eagle, that today we will um, keep uh, discussing in part. So today's video gets down to, well, mostly in the most iconic, let's say, phase of uh, Roman history, um, the, the military insignia were fundamentally about. We have to make um, another video definitely about the Republican and archaic times uh, and also also kind of later times, like what were standards in Byzantine uh, in the Byzantine period and so on. Uh, so it's really simple. In a way, I'll try to add some info on the base, mostly of our, uh, let's say, religious symbolic background that we addressed also elsewhere with a series of the, on, on uh, the animal symbolism, you know, in medieval imaginary that, however, uh, dated back to, to the ancient world, right? And we um, have to bear always this in mind, as always, that any moral principle existing in the ancient world was based solely on a religious and military base. I will never cease to <laughs> to remind this, um, as it's actually quite correct, and especially in these times, right? Eventually things went gradually secularizing. In a sense, the Romans were part more secular than than other, especially more primitive societies, etc. But they fundamentally shared uh, a religion that was universal, right? It was not a boundary between, there is no such thing like, I don't know, a Greek religion or a Roman religion. Uh, we used to define these in saying, you know, what did they specifically believe in a way, locally, how they, they approach the things, because there were m many different gods. But at the end of the day, all the ancient world peoples shared the same essentials about essentially the celestial deity of the sky delivering the military glory to the most virtues, right? And this is a, 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 an ethical system was shared literally by everybody. That is, to a German, it was a limpidly clear what the Roman eagle was, was about, also because they had the same thing on their own. And everybody knew. And, and uh, there was no... Because these were, say, universal symbols in the manner in which the, the animal symbolism and also other aspects of the you know celestial bodies and other um, ob let's say um, meant in a broader anthropological sense, not just because the world was of course in contact uh, with, with each other, you know, all uh, all the continents ever since ever basically um, the humans spread uh, across, but um, so m ideas did circulate and people did circulate specifically but also because there is some kind of um, you know almost natural reaction given the the role the, the habits of certain animals for example in the relation of uh, of man etc the eagle for example the symbol of the roman empire was essentially the universal empire of the the whole eurasian you know uh, continent right if you really want to uh, there were different ones right depending also on the different animals. Some were hawks, some were vultures, etc., depending on this. But, you know, wolf skins, uh, it's the same everywhere, right? Even Egyptian pharaohs wore wolf skins to be possessed by the, the deity. Um, so there is nothing specific or ethnically distinctive, if not on the base of the local fauna, right? Uh, the bear is some what kind of more northern in nature, but uh, it was shared by everybody, and even there, of course, in a world that traded extensively, not all. Uh, and yes, the same exact principles here, we could digress further, um, properly stressing the case of the Romans, the Indo-European uh, base, of the, the, all, all the other peoples, but it goes really beyond, right? So uh, it may sur sound surprising to some that the Romans had sagas and berserkers and, you know, wolf and nars is just like, you know, mostly we associate in a hysterical, uh, ethnicistic sense to, to the Nordic world, but it, it it was pretty much universal since ever, since millennia, right? And even the Europeans have all that thing since ever. It's like the same concept of, uh, also of behavior, of chivalric, uh, what we we call this chivalric idea it was fundamentally the same base of the 
the heroic, uh, in this sense, military, where many people don't know that the, the Fuhrer and the Virtus are at the root of the historical meaning, actually the same thing. Um, and um, yeah, th there would be a lot to, to tell about this, but uh, fundamentally, we <laughs> today, let's stick to the standards, and at some point we will... Uh, well, let's stick to the standards as good legionnaires, <laughs> because that's actually, as we will see, the, the, the purpose of the same, like for any other people, by the way, um, and uh, other universal function. And we will see this maybe in something dedicated more specifically to, to the history of religions. Now, so Imperial Roman Army, early Imperial Roman Army, right? Um, so literally the moment in which Rome ruled over the world, right? At this point... Rome is uh, is the center of the world. It doesn't matter. It's not a matter of you know a, a plot of land that is not occupied. It's virtually an ecumenic empire. So it doesn't matter where you are from. Fundamentally, you fit in, right? Say, but China, well, China doesn't fit that world, right? They 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 from their perspective, those people who were invested by the Roman Empire directly or indirectly. You know, Rome didn't know about peoples that 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 used its own hardware, for example. Roman artifacts are to be found up to the Urals, right? And the Romans didn't even know that Russia existed. That's how far uh, reaching uh, Roman civilization and at this point it is. And it's something, if you think about it, it's it's frightening, even by this, the scale you know, of, of the legacy that this remains also for the Western world. Um, and deeply rooted. So, now... This is the point. The insignia represented that dominion. Because, as we were saying before, there is nothing to define a power of any sort in the ancient world but its religious and military principle. Right? The Romans had conquered the known world with their legions. And, as Flavius Josephus said, the Roman eagle was essentially conceived as a nom by the Romans as a nomen that they would conquer all against whom they marched. Right, and and by and other peoples were terroristically aware of this, um, and so the 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 imperium as such was that military power embodied from a divine point of view. But the imperium passed through the sacred, right, and the insignia were sacred. Right. We unfortunately we don't know much about this. This like about the ancient world we have here and there this actually abundant amount of information that tells us what these symbols meant for these peoples. But um, we don't have like anybody factually telling us from a let's say a folk perspective what what the actual logic explicitly was about them. What they they literally felt. There are certain symbols also in the Roman army that uh, is uh, overwhelmingly the most and best documented of the ancient world but since it's, it's in the ancient world it's also like the info is still scanning we, we don't know much about the Roman army at all right uh, overall it's our understanding is pretty scarce um, sometimes we don't even know in fact what certain symbols actually meant there are some you know anal reasoning by analogy comparative stuff but we can't assume, but the specificity sometimes escapes us. Also because there wasn't much of a uniformity in this sense. It is, as we've seen, uh, there was some essential religious belief. But as in any uh, aspect of pagan society, it, would, it remained also throughout monotheism for, for millennia. Uh, the, um, you know, you know, the... the the, the creation was dominated, but but so many other essentially emanations, expressions, and manifestations of of, of the same world that were different deities, different uh, even spirits, etc. Um, so every I don't know every, every legion had also uh, uh, other s symbols, famously enough, attached. To them. They were mostly animals, right? They were zodiac things. You know, they they the same cohorts as we've seen. They had their own insignia and they had their own symbols, presumably. Um, uh, according, in fact, we think generally that even as far as the uh, uniformity in colors or things like that, the, the probably the most uniform units were probably the cohorts, right? And most legionnaires would rather identify first with the cohort and then with the legion in itself because it was pretty large. 
Um, so mm, insignia were could be as diverse, right, as all these different units. It literally had a story, right? You know, every legion, every unit, subunit, etc., had a past, had a memory, had an administration, uh, had uh, a mythology. Right, had a propaganda, had an exaltation of itself. Uh, Roman legionnaires were indoctrinated since the very beginning to believe that they were the single most powerful fighters around because the deity fundamentally passed through them, through their insignia and therefore the discipline and command in the combat uh, to essentially annihilate any kind of living being who would oppose to them. Right, the the level of mental exaltation that ancient warriors had is something that we have lost, right? Um, brutally so, and it went on already by the Middle Ages was fundamentally down, was mitigated, and we we kind of grasp just what this was about. But these people were living in realities that we can't even properly understand, even just as an experience. We don't have to think it just about the brutality of it. The Roman army was uh, the strongest in, in, in ancient history, not because it was, in fact, um, imbued with this kind of ideals, rather um, the fact that they they were the expression of, of the most advanced civilization that the world had ever seen, uh, and that, of course, in an intelligent and rational fashion, had managed to deliver, thanks to collective training and discipline, the greatest effect with a minimal effort, but the same Romans were not very distant from the same tribal societies that they systematically um, exterminated, um, as the same tribal realities did with each other on a regular basis, as basically the single acti- the only activity that they existed for, because once again, th- those were essentially imbued with the same idea of a religious military principle that made them believe that the strongest has the right to, not just to rule, but fundamentally to exterminate, enslave, and rape any single defeated, because at that point they, they were they had lost properly divine favor, and the, the same possibility of doing that was the proof that the divinity was okay with that, and this is the only moral principle that exists in, in the ancient world, in, in, in any single culture, um, and this um, was, of course, um, you know, the, the more the you, know, you invest in the, in the individuality, of course, the the, the weaker, the lesser of a military quality you have, mil, um, you know, culturally speaking. Uh, but of course, the individual would at that point be overloaded more to compensate this collective incapacity uh, of its community uh, to, with that, you know, exaltation to to make it functional in order to to compensate for that gap. Um, so um, the insignia were still considered in a fanatic sense. Right, these were sacred. That means that soldiers swore an oath on them, right? And this oath was to defend them with their own lives, right? And uh, also in here, in fact, Rome, the Roman army has a story, as we will quote later. There was, you see, um, um, the the insignia were not just a point of reference for the troops on the march and in battle, because as objects, that's what they were fundamentally uh, designed for. But they they also played, of course, an important role in the transmission of information and orders that had to be visually recognizable. And you know these things went up and were in the front rank, so everybody every soldier could see them. Um, and but they also were entr- had always been entrusted to selected men on the basis of their valor and courage, right? Because these soldiers were had had to be able to defend insignia strenuously right and to carry out orders even in the most difficult situations so uh, we have an explicit info about uh, this uh, this regulation just for later times in the sixth century that tells you how under documented we are at the end uh, at the end of the day from the strategic one eight that uh, tells us how still at that point um, uh, you know Harsh punishments were contemplated for the uh, significant who were not up to the task. It said, if, quote, if, if a banner were to be captured by the enemy, may this never happen without an acceptable and evident cause. We ordered that those in charge of custody of the standard are punished and de- uh, degraded to the lowest rank in their unit or scholar in which they are registered. 
and uh, there is this general historiographical understanding that by the 6th century discipline was somewhat more lax, not because the army in itself was less effective in, in, in principle or in practice, but because simply, you know, there were political or social reasons why you couldn't stress more than much uh, discipline in certain circumstances, considering properly the composition of the army, how wars were fought, so everything closely it's in meant. In, in, in ancient times, things had been definitely different. We know, and we will see this in the video about archaic times and uh, republican times, that you know, losing the insignia was like, you were done for. Think about the veterans of Cannae that were sent to, to Sicily. Nobody wanted to know even anything about them because they had lost. And therefore, you see, that's the, the religious military view. The gods had forsaken them. Right, they 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 were no more. Uh, this is the same thing we read for the the Germans in Tacitus. That that is, you you if you if if you lose your your standards, if you flee in battle, you're you're not a you're not a living being anymore. Right, these are the core beliefs of these societies. There is nothing else on the horizon from a moral point of view. Um, so uh, at that point. Ideally, a, a unit would have preferred to be exterminated than to lose its standards. There are instances in the Roman sagas that tell us that the, the same uh, Roman commanders in, in, time, in, in critical times of the battle, they, they would throw their, they, their, insi their, their unit insignia within the enemy ranks to essentially oblige uh, their own soldiers to, to attack into them, taken back, because if they had lost them, they would have been dead in in front of of the gods because they had sworn an oath, right? Either you die, or you or you keep those insignia. There is no halfway, right? So society cannot accept you back. It's like the devotio, right? It's the same exact thing, and that's where the Romans, of course, came from, and not even so many centuries before, right? The Romans had a, a dramatically fast process from you know development for a primitive society into into a into a uh, a civilization, uh, and they 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 retained this uh, kind of um, vision in properly in the nature of their own military, uh, differently from the Greeks, for example. Um, we talked about this uh, when we talked about I don't remember what's the title of that video, but it was properly about the very discipline, right? The more as yes, the the uh, the moral superiority of discipline and the superiority of discipline, something like that, right? That, that explains the difference. You can check that. It's, it's in the historian playlist. Um, so the types of insignia most in use in the first two centuries of the uh, Principatus were essentially three, right? The eagle, the aquila, the vexillum, and the signum. Mm -hmm. So the eagle had been namely established by Caius Marius as a unique symbol for all the legions since 100 BC circa. Before the Romans used also something else like bulls, um, you know, horses, things you know, like this. And, and they could vary, right? And uh, because even there each legion had its kind of its own story, its own spirit, its own, its own guardian right and its own nature and character um and um the uh, we have to think even different uh, different colors different uh, different even specialties in a sense right uh, of course the marian reform had uh, not militarily but simply from a political and social point of view homogenized the um, the recruitment the extraction of troops so much had been flattened in this sense but we would be surprised to see how even still early imperial uh, uh, Roman legions would be actually mm, heterogeneous in, in, in appearance. Um, so mm, there, the eagle had the eagle already existed, of course, among those symbols in the centuries before, and and it was already associated uh, with the uh, you know with, the, with all the religious meanings we were saying before uh, as the superior. Uh, animal for its extraordinary qualities, and as we were saying before, um, the it was recognized as as a symbol uh, of uh, and a synonym for the legion in itself. We get this, for example, for from Caesar, the Hispanic War thirty, 
or Tacitus uh, Nullus 1338, right? Uh, and this is the the core the core meaning of it because the the eagle that marched at the head of the legions, right, on the properly as the leader, had a, a deeply rooted religious and and an overwhelming by scale, right, also properly in terms of international recognition, religious meaning, right, it was the symbol of Jupiter, the greatest deity uh, of of the Romans, but as you know, of you know, a Jupiter existed for the, as the, the the supreme celestial deity um, of war, right? For for all these other peoples, and it was thought to be the only bird to be able to rise up to the sky and look to the sun straight, right, uh, with its eyes. It was simply the, the ferocious predator, rapacious uh, aggressor that would uh, devour its victims without even, you know caring for them. This is exactly the predatory, expansionistic, imperialistic view that dominated the ancient world. The, the sole purpose of, of, of any people in the ancient world was conquering the world and crushing any other culture and civilization under its feet. Right? It, it, it was... Um, the, the eagle was was the, the symbol of Rome itself. Right? You know, the symbol of protection of, of Jupiter over the holy city that ruled the entire known world, right? And therefore, it embodied by itself, simply, the greatest power and authority existing in the universe. Uh, Rome was equated to it. Um, the, the, there is a passage before the Battle of Idastavisus, right? When Germanicus was, uh, you know, uh, recuperating the eagles uh, taken by the Germans after the uh, the Clades Variana, um, uh, Tactus Annalis uh, two seventeen says almost as a wish for luck, Germanicus saw eight eagles flying towards the forest. This is this Ecos Romulus omen. Uh, he then commanded the soldiers with a loud voice to march forward and follow the birds that symbolized Rome, protectors of the legions. Right, so um, the eagles were guiding the Roman army against the Germans to victory. Um, the, the the visionary dimension here, here we, we one thing that we have forgotten completely as modern people, and we can't fundamentally understand anymore, and that also should us should make us reflect very deeply when we pretend to even come close to any understanding of history or pretending that reconstructions or reenactment or whatever have anything to do with historical reality is the multisensoriality of that experience. That is to say, sounds, images, lifestyle, creed, the songs, uh, the, the musical instruments. We made a video about that for the Roman army, not only also for the Celts, were all part essentially of replicating a sort of, um, of trance, right? Uh, in which the, uh, essentially the, the war took place in a holy uh, dimension, right? Uh, all the ancient wars were holy wars. Recently we were talking just about the crusade and it, it's ridiculous how even, I'm a medievalist, I can't say that, you know, how medievistics somewhat ignores still this dimension. That is to say, uh, there is no such thing like a war of religion began with, I don't know, the crusades or confessional clashes. Every single war that had ever been fought was exclusively religious because there was no other way but to go at war because the gods had allowed you to, right? No people in the ancient world could go at war if, if it didn't perform the procedures that would ensure them that the gods told them to go to kill others, right? Uh, and they obeyed to their will unconditionally, right? Um, so this role military dimension it w w was lived as a sort of um, contact with the, the afterlife. I mean, this is this kind of well-known. Consider all the... the, the uh, Look at the decursio, the funeral of, of, of Roman emperors. So look at, think about, the, think about the you know, Germanic tribes or the other people, the, the, the idea of the Valhalla, etc. That's a purely religious and military cause. It never, never ever think that, you know, <laughs> monotheism has anything to do with pushing more war because these cultures were exclusively about war 
as we were saying before, it, it's it's somewhat disgusting how the contemporary mindset has completely eradicated this in its miserable moral uh, inferiority uh, when talking about the the entire evidence that we get from the ancient world, right? That just as psychotic modernist uh, positivistic minds, we we can't we can't accept anymore because they would reveal our own dramatic incapacity as and failure as human beings. Uh, this was the entire meaning of the world, and was nothing else beyond it, and whoever betrayed it had to die, right? In the ancient world, there is no thing, religiously speaking, by a freedom of conscience. You had to do essentially what your society said, because if, if, if the sacrifices had told that that was the case, you couldn't go against that case. Right, monotheism stripped away freedom of cult, but restored, you know, freedom of conscience. In the ancient world, was in paganism there was freedom of cult, but no freedom of conscience. You were obliged to fit this, and if you wouldn't, the penalty was death. Right, uh, the same reason why there were religious persecutions, which existed in the ancient world, in paganism everywhere. Right, uh, witchcraft was persecuted, for example, in the same uh, way. Uh, that's not a matter of religion. That's a matter of political and social organization, right, of human communities. Um, why? Because the methods of stillness, the instability, the near instability of these communities, uh, rendered necessary. And that's even in the case of tribes, especially the constant. Uh, exercise of arms. Nobody could live outside that capacity because if they had done it. The, the community would have collapsed and it would have gotten, again, exterminated, enslaved and raped by next newcomers, right, their own neighbors, whoever they were, right? Look at what, the, when, when it was said that the Romans made desert and they called it peace. We know that it wasn't always the case, but when they did it, they went exterminate, it was literally so, archaeology tells us. Right. The same goes for the smaller tribes. The Germans invited Romans to watch over massacres of entire Germanic peoples under their eyes for sadistic pride of showing their own power, right? Comparticipating, in a sense, to the Roman one. Because that the Imperium was universal. The whole Renovatio Imperium thing of the Middle Ages was based in a Christian way, still on the same exact concept that there is one Imperium, that the rule, the, the world is one, right? So if you control it all, you have it all. If you control it in part, you still have it in part, and you can't participate to that divine gift because of your military virtue that is exclusively military in that sense i want to hammer you with this concept because there is no other way you can frame ancient history the, all the rest in a civic kind of you know rationalistic sense is, is a complete invention of the last mm, century fundamentally there is uh, or two there is there was none of that before even conceptually right before pre-industrial times uh, the um you see, the, 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 the Roman vexillum is that passing on consisted of a rectangular cloth, fundamentally, with, which depicted the symbols and almost certainly the name or initials of the unit. Hmm. Um, it, it was stiffened. We, we have just one example from the early 3rd century. Right? It was stiffened by a wooden loop held above the co single cohortes and cavalry ally as the main dis and distinctive uh, insignia of the unit. And the vexillum was also the characteristic sign that uh, it represented the unit called for this, in fact, vexillatio, right? Uh, that more and more often, starting from the second century, uh, the, say, sedentary legions sent to participate uh, in, a, in a war, right? And um, almost intact, uh, as we were saying before, we have a 3rd century uh, specimen of vexillum recovered uh, in Egypt that, due to the dry weather, kind of preserved us more of these or organic material. Um, it dates, uh, yeah, um, it, it, it was recovered at the beginning of the, love of the, of the last century, right? it represents uh, a victoria, victory, standing on a globe. That's our. Uh, the victory was meant properly to be the day that crowned you with the military glory, right? The eagle was meant. Uh, also, the wings. Even if it's the same thing. It's the same. Um, Inferic slash. It, it both tonic and and uh, uranic. Uh, it's like angels in the Bible. They're essentially 
um, you know, the, 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 those same power holders, representative, representative of the of the previous, the pre-monotheistic uh, um, religions, uh, you know, the deities that that owned power as war, uh, essentially heroes, eventually deified, etc. Um, and the, the victories, it, you have to think the the fear here was yes, the the fear of of the sky, the fear of this immense force that would that was terribly either rewarding you or wiping you from the face of the earth. And the victory here stands on a globe, while she holds in her hands a palm, right, and a crown. Um, and uh, the, the the color of the cloth is red, and victory was the accomplishment of the Imperium uh, itself, of course. It was the proof, the sanction. And all that. Then there was the signum, as the um, distinctive insignia of the operational units of the Roman army. It had, it had a essentially, as we've seen as the others, a technical function as well as a symbolic one. Um, as an insignia of a maniple or of a sentry was, in fact, both on the march and in battle, the constant point of reference for the soldiers were part of it, together with the crista transversa of their own centurions. Right, Centurions had the transverse crest in their helmets because from the behind they, they, they could be more visible. Right, um, so they had a more recognizable profile, and that was fundamental to follow your leader in combat. Um, now, and and it was the the same one issuing orders. So also, the role of these NCOs, etc., was actually still part of the religious one. There were certain specific cults and practices, you know, um, that in this sense uh, burdened the the these um, these figures would the, the of with responsibility that that descended, right, from the commander up to them, right. The, ideally, the imperium yes descended uh, on on the on the on the imperator specifically, and then but also on his troops that in a sense partook to to the to the uh, you know and had their own individual responsibility in that sense because everybody is responsible for the. Uh, Price that the deity will uh, give you in that in that sense. So, and um, the esprit de corps was everything because, as you know, in every unit, the greater the civilization, the, the more insignificant the individual in front of the unit, right? You wouldn't have a civilization with with a with a charismatic warrior that essentially fights only for itself, right? That you may have, you know, that society functioning in a clinic sense by that because that's literally the most complex form you you can of of community organization you can have and that performs its role but the pure value of military civilization stands within the fact that if you even dare to to think that you are more important than your own unit you should be beaten to death right and and that's actually not very different from what what happened in the roman army right you you, you would have not wanted to to get in it, but still, for those time standards, it wasn't even one of the worst things that could could happen to you. And uh, the same thing actually happened in the, in the, in fact, in the most advanced, more kind of semi-professional bands. Unless it's just you know, think about the Germanic or Celtic uh, war bands, the comitatus, etc. Uh, that's in fact where the quality stood um, yeah, as an elite. Um, the 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 signum also had to signal the maneuvers that the uh, unit had to carry out with simple, clearly visible movements. This went in parallel with sounds, as we were saying before. It was fundamental, vital, vision, hearing, so much that if you look at the Roman helmets, and not only those, here we see that you know the ear may seem dramatically uncovered, but it still had good protection protection, reinforcement, how likely it is that to be hit there, it's still a possibility, um, but uh, still it's more important to be able to listen to the orders in order to perform it in, in immediately, right, because that could, re that, that, that means collective training, right, uh, whereas a single guy out there trying to make on its own, well, would have been taken out, so that was learned fast, and as it is in any professional military. Now, uh, the signum generally consisted of a long pole, 
on which a series of falerai, half moons, and decorations uh, gained by the unit were applied, such as the corone murales, valares, and navales. We will make a video about uh, those uh, military decorations. So it was also a way to, to show properly the the, the 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 military quality, the grade of the unit. Right, because there was a, an, a competition within the same army for, for, for that. And of course, different quality um, equated to different tactical roles, or properly also, uh, as we've seen in the formation, Roman literary formation videos, properly the dispositions of even the cohorts within the same the same uh, array, etc. And um, the pole then was equipped with, uh, at the lower end with a, with a tip known as the cuspis, um, or a combination of tips uh, m uh, to make the, ins the, the fixing, the insertion into the ground more stable and to give the signifier a possibility of defense, right? Because usually they, uh, you know, the, the signifier was the one that brought the, the signum. And uh, he he's often represented stereotypically, you know, with a signum in one hand, and and this um, often with with a kind of a buckler around his uh, the the wrist, you know, uh, which he, he held the signum, and the other hand he, uh, wielding a sword, right? But uh, the signum could also be properly planted on the ground, um, and the uh, signifier could fight with with other means. Um, also, because they were properly the ones that uh, were, it would have been difficult to fight with a signum by a certain degree, um, without the protection of a larger shield or whatever other equipment, um, and uh, and yet these were the men who had properly to be the least vulnerable because they were the ones, as we've seen, that could not lose the signum, right? Must not. Like there was no no half measure. Uh, Svetonius talks about this, but let's say the the signia used in the early empire were completely equivalent to those um, characteristic of the republican period, and we will look at that on another occasion. However, the um, Praetorian cohorts, uh, you see, the Praetorians already existed since ever, but not that were not formalized in the nine cohorts stationed in Rome, and especially by Tiberius, etc., uh, uh, began to use, to, to add the portrait, uh, the imago, literally, of the emperor, uh, together with the other symbols. You know that uh, the Praetorians of this emperor, someone showed it with a, with a symbol of Scorpio, it was uh, Tiberius' zodiac sign, it all these... Um, so, yeah, they, they, they were also very connected in this regard, as you have to imagine, to the probably to the memory of their leaders. I mean, Caesar's legions, in this sense, enjoyed, historically, uh, in the, in the, in the administ in their administrative continuity in the Roman army, are, are a huge prestige. Um, they brought, if you think about the, 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 the 8th Legion Augusta, the, you know, the, they, properly, they, they were units on their own. They had their own identity, they detached from the others, right? Um, there were other symbols, for, uh, for example, the globe known as Pila, uh, which symbolized the dominion of Rome over the world. Right? This is still remembered by Isidore of Seville in the etymologies, eighteen uh, three, or a statuette of victory, or some other deity, as visible on uh, Trajan's column and on uh, Constantine's uh, ark that were uh, often, you know, brought, represented on, on a portrait of the insignia. And then there were certainly also cohort insignia. Caesar uh, in the Gallic War 225 talks about it. Uh, Tactus in the Annales 118 talks about it. Um, as we were saying the, before, the cohort was this massive, uh, you know, massively cohesive uh, unit of the legion, the larger one where, as a subunit and that with which the, the legionnaire would mostly identify with by proper by core value. And from the second century onwards, 
but probably also earlier. It's just that it's not documented explicitly. Uh, the uh, dragon, the Draco, as a symbol of Dacian and, and Sarmatic origin, but even in there was kind of, yeah, I mean, mostly from from the steppe, but not just so. Was was widely used as a cohort insignia as well, right? Um, this was carried by the standard bearer would take thus the name of Draconarius, and this is most even in the late Roman army, the same Vegetius to thirteen talks explicitly about it. Uh, the dragon was more connected with uh, the steps for many reasons that have to do with the cultures of those peoples, the um, the advanced metallurgy and the, the symbol properly that in that world the, the, the armored um, man, the sword, have. Um, and uh, it's still, however, connected uh, with many other Indo-European um, uh, you know, mythology of of, of of the Mediterranean of Europe um, and it um, it embodied yet another uh, you know manifestation of, of that uh, military deity uh, of the sky uh, we were talking about it recently when making that video on the Dacians and uh, looking at their draconis that actually are essentially dog they're wolves right and fr from that you, you can get also the ferocity of that world. I mean, if you look at the art of it, you see that that grain, that, those eyes are pure evil. Like, they, they were meant to scare, they had to express the sanguinary ferocity that a soldier was expected to present. Right? On, on the Trajan column, we find, I, we don't know whether it's a legionary or an auxiliary, li literally keeping a, a, a silvered head in its mouth by by biting its air, right? Um, the, the the Romans had notoriously a a true passion for decapitations. There was a a scale of contempt for human life in in, in the ancient world that we can't barely imagine. Like just imagine to live in a world where if you have a slave that's a, an object, right, and not a human being. Uh, literally, there was no difference perceived at the time. And this was universally valid. So Im imagine what this means even just in a war. And, and what, imagine what's the standard of violence that is uh, unleashed. Uh, even just in the way it's carried out, right? The Romans, you know, just the, the massive uh, information we have on Roman military history tells us how, you know, coldly rationalized was, you know, the politics and strategy of I don't know counterinsurgency etc. You know sometimes peoples who had done nothing were literally wiped out from the face of the earth um, for for reasons of local political strategical balance. While others that had openly rebelled and had been defeated once again uh, and uh, after uh, having you know surrendered were spared. Right? This th that's the language of civilization. That's properly understanding how to rule an empire of that dimension, having to understand realpolitik and not, you know, blind fanatism um, uh, and cruelty as such. But the properly the, the core human values, it, it, we, we, we don't have, uh, even have to think that they enjoyed killing people just for it. They didn't care about that. It's, it's just that the world was, uh, as we were saying before, so unstable and so... Um, ferociously competitive and ambitious that uh, uh, there was nothing like uh, another option to actually conform to those dynamics, right? You, you can't, in this sense, if you contextualize, uh, I don't know, Roman violence, uh, Celtic violence, etc., they were all responding to an iron logic that uh, today we just use as, you know, for hysterical, you know, ungrown... Uh, children to say who was right and who was wrong was whether the good guy or the bad guy because we have completely lost the plot in the name of I don't know even what it's mostly ethno-nationalism and um, and also sometimes even of leftism that resumed tribalism both, both right and wing and, and left wing um, uh, have resumed um, tribalism and that is a pretty good evidence of their mental feebleness but um, Th these people were 
they had, this is the point what I say, that they were able to carry these things out because they were normally exposed to the to the to the necessity of it. That it was not necessary to kill all uh, people that you had just conquered. It depends. N nobody did that for a specific reason of lust of cruelty. There, there was uh, properly a political reason for doing that, which was, for example, repeatedly evident every all the time somebody rebelled and you, you needed to secure the area, for example, to stabilize it, to pacify it. At some other point, it was a matter of letting them go because you, you wouldn't be able to, 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 to sub them on, on the long run. They were not even worth it economically. Other times was properly integrating them, civilizing them, and um, providing them, you know, making them participate in co-opting them, fundamentally co-opting their elites. Uh, all these things, and probably the Romans are the most brilliant example of pragmatism in, in historical terms. Like, if you want to psychoanalyze the Romans, in this sense, they, they were completely ruthless. That is to say, they didn't give an after damn about anybody as long as things worked. And thankfully, we had a Roman Empire uh, that allowed, the harbored, and properly cultivated the that transition that we were saying before from, you know, essentially the absence of a freedom of conscience to something more, you know, refined and spiritual and, you know, and intelligent for, for, for that matter. But you have to think that the world from before didn't come from anything like that. It had to be built. And uh, for for most, for, for, for tribes, that, that is, um, you know, you have just to survive. You, you, you don't have the luxury of thinking uh, these things. And that's why the world and civilizations you know, say, are built, and it takes an awful lot of time, and an awful lot of sacrifice, and an awful lot of failures, and of contrasts, of distractions, of, of, of tragedies. But without those, there would have not been that step forward, not, I mean, to understand properly that taking things from another perspective, using, developing other means, is, is a way to, to avoid it. Right, it, as ugly as it sounds, it's what we have to live for as human beings, because our entire history is fundamentally an endless bath of blood. And if you don't try to, to make, uh, like, there are not many options. Like, either you think that you you belong to a, to a murderous species that shouldn't even be on Earth, or you try to make sense as history, politology, sociology, anthropology, history of religion, uh, biology make or psychology otherwise uh you know you're done for <laughs> you can't you can't kill yourself because it, literally there's no other way of seeing it uh now uh, relatively to the imaginus to the imago plural um after augustus that san had sanctioned a, a big deal properly also in, in terms of this um institutionalized um religious and cultural vision in, in an extremely sophisticated and and uh, effective propaganda that in fact leaves uh, up to, to to this day the imago um, became common ag among the legionary and auxiliary insignia right it was an effigy of the emperor's face sometimes accompanied by by the name uh, Suetonius in Vespasian 6 uh, talks about this was a, a mean of of stating the allegiance to uh, the imperial uh, government that once again was embodied by the imperator that since Augustus is literally the one that this is said in the res gestae who gets the auspices from the god so it's a median between the celestial deity of this sky and and the world Right, so it's not somebody that you can bypass in terms of you know whatever you're doing on this earth. It has a deep, once again, religious and military meaning. And in fact, the imago, the emperor's imago, was carried by a special imaginifer, was literally the guy who had the task of carrying it out. And the imago, in fact, in, in addition to representing the power of the emperor, as we see, was also an object of worship and religious veneration, as we've seen. Um, because, as we were saying before, he was, said that the emperor was the mean through which the imperium could be obtained by the army, by the troops, right? And it, it's under his guidance that 
the, the Roman army could win. Uh, this veneration is well witnessed in uh, Flavius Josephus in the Jewish War 2-9, um, Suetonius Caligula 14. Uh, also in time of civil war, the Imagines came to be you know, less uh, ideally functional because, um, for example, in 68 uh, AD, the legions of the Rhine, who supported Vitellius, began the revolt by destroying the Imagines of Galba. This is what Tacitus says in his Histories uh, 155. And, uh, and even the Praetorian prefect, as in the case of Sejanus, this is told by Suetonius Tiberius 48, seems to have had the right to an image, right? Uh, because the Praetor was literally the guy who, you know, preceded uh, the, uh, the the emperor had that kind of share, partly shared in the the, uh, the the imperium in that sense. So, um, in theory, any magistracy, also historically, that had that had some military function was fundamentally endowed via the the priests uh, through through that faculty, and that's the same reason why the same emperors had become um, pontificus maximi, because they were literally the media, as we were saying before, between that. Uh, supernatural power and the world. So much as we were saying before, remembering the Decursio, for example, all the military decorations won by the by the army were thrown on the burning pyre of the emperor, so that his soul, let's say, the the military value that lay in them, the sacred nature of it, would would return to the imperator that had from which it had emanated, and 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 his and his soul could be elevated to the skies to sit next to the other gods in the process of deification. And of course, it's one of the most magnificent testaments to the Indo-European legacy of Roman civilization it was still around the, you know, the, the, there was all these horsemen literally circling around the equites, the Roman knights throwing their own decorations onto the pyre. This, this magnificent spectacle that had to embody the solemnity of the Imperium returning to the eternal heavens, without which mortals couldn't even dream to accomplish anything in their lives, right? And that these most greatest figures of virtues into which the whole power of the world had embodied in the form of, 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 of emperors would be elevated, would be the only one worth being elevated to the rank of deity. Right, and um, and these this connection with individuals is crucial, right? Because in Roman history, emperors often, especially from the, since the third century, began to collect the legacy of other emperors in that regard, the properly taking on their their spirit and kind of continuing their legacy. Constantine, with Claudius Gothicus, for example, to properly embody the same imperium. Right, and eventually, re, through that, reconquering the world, re, reuniting the world, as in the case of Constantine is quite eloquently done. Right, but this was literally conceived in the unity of the Roman Empire as the entire world rule. Right, and these military symbols were the ones in front of which you would have not liked to find yourself in front. Right, opposing, and the the scale of fear and uh, terror and paralyzing capacity. That even just these visions, we we get it from ancient history. We know that the the even the, the properly in the in dreams that were so important for telling for telling the future, um, for properly connecting to the supernatural. They told you that these the the the, the, the vision of 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 the of an eagle, of a winged, uh, of, of a terrible, of inferic winged deity of war that ravaged, that, that collected, that massacred, that collected souls on the battlefield was, was present in the mythology of all these peoples that were terrorized because in, in the panic of, 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 of a flight, of a, of a cavalry charge, they, they wouldn't distinguish anymore, right? If, if you look at a Sarmatian knight, you know, that from, from the terrible deities stemming from the earth or heaven um, in mixing into one and in, in, in fearing. You live in a world where there are, you, you believe that there are demigods. Right? How can you not fear? 
and in, in the misery of, of the world also that, that you see constantly and how you say how could this thing stand on its feet as an empire um, it, 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 it's unfortunately a, a mentality we can't revert to effectively uh, fortunately so because we live in a much better place and we don't need that anymore but that was the way civilization progressed Right, it's through those steps, it's through that deterrence, it's through that violence, it's through that rule, it's through that law, it's through that justice, through that propaganda, that step by step, as we we're saying before, an improvement was achieved. Right? And never give it for granted. Never think that you have nothing to do with that, because in the moment in which you believe so, you have already lost. And this is exactly what they believed. And what belief and faith exists for these people were soaked into it because they knew how functional it was to make a world work today there is none of that anymore and it's dangerous right and it's dangerous not because we need some uh, something to 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 kill name for but it, it because we have completely lost the connection between individual responsibility and um and practical reality and all the, the consequences that derive from that, you know, and the moral, morally speaking, that is, we don't understand the world we live in anymore, and we don't even make an effort to fill that gap. But uh, this is just, you know, one of my uh, eschatological considerations. But for now, just hope that you enjoyed this video. Uh, if you did, please share it, otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time.